what do Italian families typically do at the end of the summer? Of course, pesto! <laughs> cooking with Mary Jane and this summer since I was settled down in an apartment I was finally able to restart my habit of farming basil so I planted my little seeds in March at the beginning of the spring and then I've had fresh basil on my fire escape here in New York City the whole summer but now the cold is arriving so I need to farm all these baby basil leaves and do something delicious with them now if you want to go directly to the recipe, feel free to do so. I will leave the timestamp, but there are some things that I need to explain before starting. This is not the real traditional original pesto alla genovese. Pesto alla genovese is a sauce for pasta, traditionally used only for pasta, that comes from the city of Genova in the region of Liguria, in the northwest of Italy. And as any regional Italian recipe, it needs local ingredients. So the ingredients for the traditional pesto alla genovese are basil, obviously, but I discovered this year actually here in New York City that there are several different types of basil. There's not only one or two, you know? So here I got the seeds from the hardware store, just a random type, type of basil, and it's this one, which is slightly different than the one that we typically use in Italy. It's brighter in color, the leaves are not as thin and tender. It's not as fragrant as well but we will adjust second ingredient pine nuts or pinoli in italian also here in your city i discovered that the pine nuts that are sold are either italians or chinese i don't know how the chinese taste like i got these amazing italian pine nuts here from my favorite spice nuts and cereal shop here in the East Village, SOS Chef on Avenue B. If anyone is interested for high quality spices, cereals, nuts, whatever, please go there. They are amazing. Then for the traditional pesto, you use two types of, che of cheese. You use Parmigiano Reggiano, which I have. It's not a particularly amazing one, but it will do. This comes directly from Italy. It's the real one. You want to look for the logo Parmigiano Reggiano on the packaging. This, that's how you know that it's the real Parmigiano Reggiano because Parmesan cheese I discovered is something completely different it's like it's terrible then i should use also some pecorino sardo a sheep old cheese from sardinia which i don't have i don't even have some other types of pecorino here i'm just gonna use one type of cheese then we have garlic i have here some garlic that i don't even know where it comes from i got it from my usual produce vendor on first avenue the traditional recipe calls for some aglio di vesalico, so garlic from a very tiny village in Liguria region called Vesalico. It's actually from the valley of the river there. Of course, even if I was in Italy, I would just get um, whatever garlic I would find. Then obviously salt. For the traditional recipe, I think it's used the salt from Trapani in Sicily. Here I have some... Mm, diamond crystal like this is the regular salt that you get at restaurant depot here and then last but absolutely not least some excellent quality extra virgin olive oil the best olive oil for a um, pesto alla genovese would be a sweet one so it doesn't overpower the flavor of the other ingredients okay these were the ingredients I have six, traditionally are seven because they use two types of cheese. The other very, very, very important note that I have to make is this is not technically a pesto because pesto in Italian means something that is smashed with the pestello, which is that um, wooden thing that you use with the marble mortar <laughs> i don't know how it's called in english we are gonna use a food processor which is what every 
modern Italian family does nowadays in Italy, but the result is quite different because the um, pestello with the mortar creates an actual emulsion, which means that it creates kind of a cream and it brings out all the essential oils of the uh, basil, the pine nuts, the garlic and so on. Whereas the blender, all it does is just cuts in super tiny pieces all the ingredients. So you can understand that conceptually is very different and the taste and texture is different too. But for practicality, we're gonna use the blender. Okay, let's start working and at the end of the video I will also tell you how to preserve the pesto because it's not like I'm making it now for the next week and that's it. Usually, usually I have way much more basil so I'm not gonna be able to, wait to make so much pesto this year but usually what I do is I freeze it so that in the middle of the winter when I feel miserable and it's gray and cold outside, I can pull out a little jar and make some pasta with it. First thing we gotta do is obviously pick the basil leaves. So I have here, I just put here my display of the two best looking plants that I have, but I have many more. Right now there is no good or bad way to pick up basil, but if you are in within the season, like the basil plants are still growing. If you want them to be taller and more productive in terms of leaves, you pick up the top. So what you gotta do is, you see these little leaves here at the armpit of the plant. You wanna pick up only the tip of the plant so that you make space for these tiny little leaves to grow and to expand the plant. I'm still gonna leave some tiny little leaves so that I can keep cooking with them in the next few weeks. But for the rest, I mean, the basil is a seasonal plant. It lasts only in the summer. Look how beautiful these leaves are. You know, usually in every apartment I've lived before, I always have a balcony. So <laughs> I have much more basil than I did, I could do this year. So usually this work is something that I do uh, two or three times in a summer. And I start from July, I would say, from when the plants start being so big and they have so many leaves that I need to do something with them because it's too much basil. But this year, this job makes me a little bit sad because it really means that the summer is over. <laughs> okay, I will leave these little poor plants like this. They look so sad though. <laughs> okay. Oh, I actually have another one. This one. You know, usually I would tell you, mmm, it smells so good, blah, blah, blah. But this basil really doesn't smell that strong and also it doesn't smell that good for some reason. <laughs> All right, next step, we gotta rinse this. There you go. It is very important that we let as much water as possible out of the leaves because we don't want an excess of water into this oil-based sauce, okay? Next step is gonna be to prepare the cheese. So I have a grater here. It's not that important what grater you use because even if it's a thick one, the cheese is gonna be blended in the end. Mm -hmm. 
So some of you may ask me, Mary Jane, why don't you cut away that piece of crust that is sticking out there? Well, because that piece of crust is a little treasure, we are certainly not going to throw it away. When all of the cheese internally is going to be finished, I'm going to use that crust. And there are a few ways that you can use the crust of Parmigiano Reggiano. Uh, I would say the most common one in um, Italian families is to put it in the soup as a flavor enhancer. In my family, I must say, we don't use it like that because my dad makes one of his own specialties. <laughs> my dad is not a big cook, but he has some few things that does very well. And one of his favorite snacks is to take the crust, clean it out a little bit because you have to clean out the external part, of course, and then put it in the microwave for like a couple of minutes until it kind of pops and it becomes something crusty and crunchy and, and actually delicious. Next thing I need to do is to prepare the garlic. I'm not a very big fan of garlic in general, but in pesto you have to. You know, when I was younger, um, I used to get pesto without garlic, like to buy at the grocery store because they make it, of course. Then luckily I grew older and I got wiser <laughs> and, I just, and I realized that you cannot have pesto without garlic. That just doesn't make much sense. Now traditionally, I mean traditionally, like back in the days, they used to use much more garlic than we Italians do nowadays. Nowadays, I guess it's not more anymore socially acceptable to eat big quantities of garlic simply because of the smell of the breath. And I guess that's also why Italian American cuisine is filled with garlic because the Italian immigrants came here back in the days and when Italian cuisine was still full of garlic then our cuisine in Italy developed in a certain way and here it developed in another way. We enjoy more uh, delicate flavors nowadays I would say. So the quantity of garlic that you're gonna use is up to you but be careful because I mean it's raw garlic <laughs> so yeah it really depends on you. Remember to cut the uh, cloves of garlic because um, yes, they all go in the blender in the end, but we want the things that we blend to be homogeneous. So unless you put the garlic first, or you see that this one has the soul, we call this central part the soul and it's a green one, which means that it has a very strong pungent flavor. So. I don't know about you in other parts of the world where you are watching from, but in Italy, as I said, we don't like very strong overpowering flavors. So we make sure when we see that sole of the garlic that we take it out if you're gonna use the whole clove of garlic. So I want to, I cut them in pretty small pieces because I want to make sure that um, <laughs> you're not gonna get in your pasta a big chunk of garlic, you know? <laughs> that wouldn't be very pleasant. Or maybe it would in other cultures, you know? People are used to so many different things. Again, in Italy, we're not used to eat such strong flavors. And there you go. Garlic is ready to go in the blender. You know, usually I do this thing with my sister together or with my mom I think I've done it once. Last year I wasn't there so I couldn't make it but I think my brother last year made it uh, for everyone. All right I guess we are ready to start blending. Let me try this wonderful pine nuts. Look at this. Let me try one. Hmm. Mm. They have a very a slightly different flavor than 
Okay, that's this. <laughs> Otherwise, hmm. <laughs> you know, memory time, Mary Jane's childhood. My grandparents had a pine nut tree in the middle of their garden. And I remember we used to play in the garden when we were kids. I'm talking about when I was like four to eight. So very little. And we used to catch these pine fruits. And then inside of them, there were the pine nuts. And the pine nuts come with this wooden, very hard shell. We would collect them and then just as a game, as a, you know, way of spending time, we would sit on the floor of the garage of my grandpa and take his hammers and hammer them to open them up and then we would be left with this little fruit this pine nut that we would eat but just because we didn't know what else to do with it you know the whole game was to just collect and open these pine nuts and then i grew older and i started making pesto and i had to go buy pine nuts because that tree doesn't make them anymore for some reason and I discovered that they are so expensive and it's so hard to find them actually good. Like even in Italy, when you go to the grocery store, the pine nuts very often are rancid inside. So yeah, that's, that was my little flashback from childhood. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go get the blades of the food processor in the fridge because I left them there. Because now I'm gonna tell you why. So I don't know if this makes any difference, to be honest, but the problem, one of the many problems of the food processor or the blender in making this kind of preparations is that the movement of the blades warms up the ingredients and the basil is a very delicate kind of leaf. With a little bit of heat, it becomes dark and of course the essential oils inside of it uh, will just kind of burn, not burn, how do you say, like we'll get ruined. So I did this thing, I don't know if it changed anything, honestly. Anyway, if you make this with the mortar, the order of the ingredients is important and it's different. I usually put everything together after making sure that everything is cut properly because you want the ingredients to be homogeneous, right? Like I cut the garlic in proportion to the pine nuts. So I want each piece of garlic to be half of a pine nut or maximum one pine nut. As for the proportion of the ingredients, I'm sorry to announce you that I don't have any proportions. I literally eyeball it and then I, after I blend it a little bit, I taste it and then I adjust the ingredients, that's what I do. And you should do it too, because every, you know, every plant of basil has a different level of taste, every cheese has a different level of flavorness, of saltness, and so on. So, let's go. Not sure if I mentioned that this is a super easy recipe. Not easy, simple, it's simple, as many Italian traditional recipes, which doesn't mean that it's easy. In fact, I think that the simple things are the trickiest one, because exactly because they are simple, you have to get them right. If you make a, even a tiny mistake in a simple recipe, it will have big consequences. <laughs> okay, let's go with some garlic. Oh, by the way, Pine nuts, not nuts, not cashews, not almonds. Pesto alla genovese is pine nuts. If you change the type of nuts, it changes the flavor. Like if you go to the grocery store, for example, and they sell this pesto that looks like pesto alla genovese, but then you read the ingredients, they never have pine nuts because they are so expensive. But the flavor changes completely. Pine nuts are there in the recipe for a reason because they are subtle and they have that certain flavor that goes well with all the other ingredients. So if you change that, you're gonna have another result. If you're on a budget, you don't have money for pine nuts, go check out the other pesto that I made in my other cooking video that I made with almonds. You can make that. Don't make this one with other type of, types of nuts. Okay, let's go with the oil. Mm. 
good quality oil. It's not worth to make this recipe if you don't have good quality ingredients. Now, let's see if this thing works. I bought it for to make this recipe. Technique. See what I'm doing? Don't blend it continuously. Please don't blend it continuously. So you screw up the whole uh, basil leaves. The goal is to heat up the thing the least as possible. That's why I put the blend the bla the blades in the fridge, which I don't suggest you to do that because I don't know if it's work. It it's the first time I do it. And especially don't blend continuously. Do little things like I was doing. All right. Now I have space so I can go on with the cheese. Just so you know, I start with this quantity of cheese. Again, I don't know if this is enough. I'm gonna taste it later and adjust the ingredients. Also, by not putting all the ingredients all together uh, at, from the beginning, in my opinion, you give time to the basil leaves and to the blades to cool down a little bit because, as I said, the movement from the blades is the real problem here. Oh, <laughs> yes! Oh, okay. Let's go with the salt before I forget. It is honestly better to have uh, a big quantity of leaves and a little blender like this one because you know what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen is that the first time I make it, I'm gonna take so much time and so many adjustments, but the next batches that I'm gonna make with this small blender, I'm gonna have a better sense of how much I need to put of each ingredient. Mm. Yes. It's already a yes. Oh, wow. Wow, that's a surprise. <laughs> I would just add a little more garlic and a little bit more pine nuts. Some more olive oil. Yeah, this one's perfect. I miss the pecorino though. What can you do? I don't have it. I don't have it. Let me warn you about something. So I've eaten growing up industrial pesto. So my mom would simply buy the jars of pesto already ready at the supermarket, at the grocery store. I used to love pesto, you know, it was, I still love it, but I used to love it also at that time. And then when I was around 20, we started making our own pesto and that just ruined my life because now I'm not able to enjoy industrial pesto anymore. <laughs> like I literally can buy the same brand and the same type that I used to grow up with that my mom would always buy and I just don't like it anymore. <laughs> so it, it's kind of bad. It's good, but it's also bad. So if you're thinking about starting to make your own pesto at home, just be aware. All right, new batch. I'm gonna keep doing this until I finish all the basil. Actually, the leaves on the bottom are a bit too wet, so I'm gonna dry them before using them. suggest you to do is to take an afternoon free you put on some music and you take your time to make this because this is gonna last you for the entire winter you know you want to make it good a 
As for how much to blend, it depends on you. Again, it's your personal taste. I like my pesto to be chunky. Now let's talk about how to preserve. Do you say preserve? I hope so. How to store it. Yeah, exactly. This little bowl here is just for presentation purposes. I usually store it in jars and put it in the freezer. That's how I keep it for the entire winter. So a jar would be something like this usually or bigger. I mean, I just, you know, clean up any jar that I use. This one was a caper jar or you might have a jam jar, whatever you are eating during the summer, you set aside these type of jars. This time, because we are also just two people in the house, I thought about having something smaller. So I kept and washed some of these containers. These are uh, here in the United States, they are used for sauces, takeaway sauces, like the soy sauce in a Chinese restaurant, they would give it to you in a container like this one. If you don't want to freeze it, if you just want to use it right away to keep it in the fridge, you can do so for weeks. I don't have experience though of keeping it for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks in my fridge, because usually after I would say three weeks we finish the jar. Logically, I think it would be final for like two months because it's preserved in oil. What I can tell you to do though is to prevent the surface of the pesto to get oxidized. So it, it becomes darker, which is just an aesthetical problem, but it also kind of changes a little bit the flavor. To prevent that, I usually pour some olive oil every time that I take out some of the pesto from the jar. Also, if it had to happen that you keep it in the fridge for too long and a little bit of mold starts to form in the surface, it's gonna form only in the parts that are exposed to air. So don't worry, underneath the surface, everything is going to be fine. Just scoop it out with a um, spoon and throw that part away and you can keep eating your pesto with no problems. Mold is normal. It means that the food has no chemicals or preservatives and anything like that. So please don't throw away your pesto only because you saw some mold. Just take that mold out and the rest is gonna be fine. Please. You wanna try some? You wanna try some? Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry, you have to make it your own. <laughs> I hope you have plenty of basil at home. Otherwise, next March, I'm gonna make a video and teach you how to plant your seeds and have your own little plantation of basil on your balcony or on your garden. I'm gonna finish this video on a very last note about how to use this pesto. So in Italy, traditionally, we use this pesto just as condiment for pasta. Especially in Liguria, where this pesto is from, it's used mainly on trenette. Trenette is a type of pasta that is very typical regional from Liguria. A very similar type of pasta that you can find everywhere, even here in the United States, so I guess also in other countries, is the linguine. And I'm actually gonna make some linguine tonight with the fresh pesto for my dinner. So I'm gonna film a couple of clips and I'm gonna put them at the very end of this video. So stay tuned till the very end of the video to see the final result. Another type of pasta that is my absolute favorite to pair with pesto alla genovese is the trofie. So trofie is a short pasta. It's kind of a rolled up pasta, whatever, you look it up on Google. It is harder to find around, so I don't know. Here in the United States, I've never seen it, but that's it. If you're in the mood for long pasta, you use trenette or linguine. If I'm in Italy and I'm in the mood for short pasta, I would pair the pesto with trofie. Ooh, another good combination, in my very personal opinion, is with orecchiette, which are usually a southern pasta, typical from Apulia, but I think they go very well with pesto. 
By traveling abroad, I've discovered that not only Pesto alla Genovese is a very, or like the variation of Pesto alla Genovese, is a very, very popular sauce or food all over the world, basically. But I've also discovered that it's not mainly used for pasta. It's also used in sandwiches, it's used on pizza, it's used on slices of bread, I don't know. Here in the United States, for example, this is something that they do a lot. They put pesto on bread or in many different other preparations, even on meat, I've seen it. And this is something that I really like about Americans. I think it's a very clever idea because it's such a versatile type of sauce. So I think we Italians should learn from that. All right, I think you have a little bit of fun. You learned something today. I hope you're gonna try this recipe if you have plenty of basil in your garden. If you don't, I hope it will trigger something in your mind so that at the end of the next winter, you're gonna plant your seeds for your own basil. And I'll see you in my next video. Bye. Bye.